I'd love to have us all stand together here in West Seattle. We're sharing a beautiful service together today as one big family, two locations, but one great family. And this morning, I'd love to just have all of us. If you feel comfortable, just lift your hands. She just sang a beautiful song about the prayer and the place where we can have confidence and faith. And that's exactly what this message is for us today. So today, would you just join me? Just lift your hands unto the Lord if you're comfortable with that. And let's call on God for a moment and open our hearts to the amazing message of Jesus, our Lord, in this, me- in this time of Christmas. Lord, we just thank you for our church. We thank you for our people. Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing right now in the midst of our congregation, both here and in West Seattle with our family. And Lord, I pray for every heart, the Lord, that today we would experience what that prayer is all about, what the message of Jesus and the message of, of Christmas is really about, our Savior and our Lord that today there would be decisions to walk out of fear, to walk out of doubt, to walk even out of places of unbelief and to come boldly before our God. Lord, we pray you'll take these next few moments and speak right to our heart. And we give you thanks. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Give somebody a, a little fist bump. Tell them, get ready because God's got a big word right for you today. And we're going to look forward to that. You know, I love this season. I love this time. And I'm just so thankful for you being here. And as you were hearing on the announcements earlier, we have a big week planned, both here and in West Seattle. Going to be a couple of Christmas Eve services in West Seattle, five over here in Issaquah. So wherever, whenever, I just hope and pray you will be a part and use this opportunity to share with your family and friends the amazing message of Jesus. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to go back to where we started last week. We began to talk last week about the peace of God that is announced in the story of Christmas. And today I wanna take it to another level and I want us to unpack and unfold the concepts that we're told about the coming of Jesus in Luke chapter two. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your devices, would you catch up with me today? Luke chapter two, and we're gonna pick it up where we talked last week, The first 15 verses, Luke 2, 1 through 15, and just really absorb some of the deep spiritual messages that the Bible gives us about the coming of Jesus and just how important and how relevant it is in our everyday life. So let's take a look. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and following says these words. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went from his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him with strips of cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. You know, we shared this scripture last week and we talked about that very last line and peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. Today, I want to take it back one other verse as we take a look at this story. Look at verse 10. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. You know, when we take this week and we take this time to celebrate Christmas, let us really take it to heart 
the spiritual reality of this week and even the importance as it leads us in our American modern calendar into the month of January where we turn the page and we really contemplate about what are things that we feel like we want to dream and lean in and believe God for. And maybe what are some things that that are in our lives that really don't belong there, things that are hindrances or things that just are holding back God's best because we hang on to some of these other things. When we really take this time and we meditate and we, and we think about it and we allow God to engage our hearts, this is a time where we can see some real breakthroughs take place in our lives. And I want to encourage us here and in West Seattle to really lean into God in this season and to believe God, to ask God, Lord, what do you want me to absorb? What do you want me to take away from this amazing message of Jesus coming into the earth? We know in this story that every part of the story of the coming of Jesus is a miracle. First and foremost is the miracle of God's own heart towards us, that God loves us so much. John 3, 16 puts it in such a crystallized form. It says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. You know, that's such an amazing thing. Then in the book of Philippians, it teaches us that even though Jesus was fully God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, co-equal, eternally existent, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, all places, that Jesus, because of God's love for humanity, Jesus willfully chose to humble himself, set aside his prerogatives, and to humbly be born into humanity. I mean, it is an amazing, almost unbelievable thought that God would love us so much that he would even come and be born in a natural way, supernatural yet natural. Think about that. Almighty God coming and being born into humanity, not the seed of a man. The angel came to Mary, this young virgin, and said to her, you're going to have a child. It's going to be the Messiah, the Christ. It's not going to be the seed of a man, but you're going to be overshadowed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and this child is going to come forth. And so when we look at Jesus, we always have to see Jesus through the lens of the supernatural, through the lens of the eternal, and even through the lens of God's amazing grace and love for us. Think about Jesus coming and being born. And we talked about last week, just the inconvenience and the difficulty of them traveling with a young girl, nine months pregnant, having to walk six or seven, maybe eight days from Nazareth all the way down through a dangerous place, crossing Samaria and coming down into Bethlehem, this little town just outside of Jerusalem. And there, when they arrived, there was no room. Think about this. Caesar Augustus had impressed and forced upon the people that they would travel to their hometown, the place of their lineage. You know, it's interesting because for all the other families, they went because it was issued by this decree. But what's interesting is for Mary and Joseph, it wasn't just the decree. Yes, they were influenced by that. But what God was doing was using even the events of man and the things of the day to bring them on God's divine GPS, his divine coordinates between geography and even the history of all humanity, that the Christ would be born in the town, a little insignificant place called Bethlehem, that it would fulfill every prophetic word talked about by the prophets, even 700 years before the birth of Jesus. It all came to pass, not just in a good little Christmas story, but in a biblical reality that God so loved the world that his son came into this world, lived a sinless life, even as Pastor Josh talked about earlier, and then ultimately went to a cross and carried my shame, my brokenness, my mistake, my failure, my hard-heartedness, my rebellion, all those things that would stand between me and the God that loved me so much. Jesus Christ came to breathe, to be that bridge and to ultimately go to the cross and by his death and his resurrection to break all of those things off of us that we might have life and have it more abundantly and have it real, have it in our homes, have it in our lives, and that it would be every day reality that we are right with God. When you look at this story, 
that I've read to you today, some people can just look at it and it kind of goes in one ear and out the other because it just seems to be a story to make a play out of or a story that's great for a shopping environment, something that just sounds so nice and a little crest and all those different things. But what I want us to see today is that this message is only significant because it's real. It's only significant because it really happened. The angels came to announce the most amazing moment of human history. And that was when God himself came and fulfilled prophecies to become our redeemer and our Lord. Look at this verse again. He says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. That's where we get the word evangel in our English word. It's where we get the word evangelism. What is that? That's where we share our faith with other people. In other words, we tell them the great news of what God has done in our lives and we give them an invitation to come and see for themselves how awesome it is to know Christ in our lives. It's where we find good news. Why is it good news? It's good news because it's an answer from heaven to every one of our lives. Yesterday I was talking with one of our friends, a member of our church, who's a police officer in Seattle, a captain in the police force. And we were talking about just the difficulty of being a police officer in today's world. Just the level of disrespect for things that once in our culture we just took for granted. Honesty, integrity. And he talked about just the anger that seems to be boiling in not only our area, but all across our country. And we see it, we hear people talk about it. Frustration, anger about politics, but it's, it's so far beyond that. It's an anger that's way more personal. It's an anger that is there in people's lives because there's places that are broken. There's people that have been walked out on. There's places that are just unresolved. There's pain and brokenness that even stretches generations. And we're struggling because we're trying to find escapism. I mean, those of you who are in West Seattle, you know what I'm talking about. Every time we drive across the West Seattle Bridge, there's the billboards that say marijuana equals peace. And that's where we're living today. Yet the police officers will talk about the opiate and uh, explosion in our culture today. Thousands of people across our country every, every year now being lo losing their lives, dying because of drug overdoses, a heroin epidemic that is absolutely unbelievable. Even in the city of Seattle, just plagued by a heroin uh, plague and uh, young people, and not even just young people, but people of all ages losing their lives to these drugs. And we're just in a society that is so tired of even fighting the drug war that we have just surrendered. So instead, what we say is, you know what the answer is to an explosion of drug abuse and brokenness, people's houses being broken into, the things that are just going, lives that are being shattered, jobs that aren't being fulfilled, all these different things that are happening. Well, we just need to make drugs legal everywhere. That's our answer because we are so without answers in our culture. And the result of that is there's more friction and division and strife because these are unresolved issues. You know why the angel came and said, I've got a message of incredible good news. In fact, it's beyond good news. It will bring great joy for all mankind. You know what that is? It's the message that a savior has been born. The Redeemer has come. The answer is here. God's heart is fulfilling his will and his word in our very lives. Wow. You know, when you think about the word joy, in our culture today. It's a word that's almost been washed out of our vocabulary. We've got all kinds of new words, street language and, and all those things that are, that are coming. And uh, you know, every day we've got to expand our, our uh, vocabulary and our dictionary for those things. But joy is a word you don't hear too much about. In fact, if you start roaming around when you're having coffee or you're at work or you're down the cubicle or you're down the cul-de-sac and you just start gushing the word joy, people are going to look at you a little funny. Isn't that true? I mean, the word joy is almost so out of our vocabulary that it's a little cheesy to even bring it up. What do you mean by joy? What is joy? That sounds kind of weird. But the truth is, is that joy is the gift that only God can bring. Joy to the world. It's more than a Christmas carol. 
It is an eternal spiritual quality and reality that God himself gives. This is a gift that can't fit under your tree. It's one that your friends or your, or your family can't go buy at the mall. It's not on sale for any price because this joy is a joy that was purchased by the redemptive work of Jesus upon a cross. If it wasn't for the birth of Jesus into humanity, there would never be the experience of human beings having the price or the penalty. We know justice in our lives, right? If somebody sins against us and they rob us, I mean, the other day, just somebody came by our house and stole a package off of our door because we were at work. And you just kind of wonder, what were those guys thinking? They don't even know what's in the box. All they knew is it was there and they took it. Hopefully they needed it more than we did. But this place today of, of people reaching in to just get whatever for a moment might solve a momentary issue for them. I want you to know that joy is not momentary. Joy is not fleeting. Joy is not human. Joy comes from being right with God. The Bible says that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Joy comes from that reality sinking deep into our lives. Joy comes where there's a sense of wholeness and a sense of wellness, a sense of, of well-being in your heart and your life where you know that, yes, I've got circumstances. Yes, I've got difficulties. Yes, I, you know, I've got to go to work and I've got bills to pay and I've got kids to raise and there's challenges and all those different things. But with all of that going on, there's this space inside of my heart that I just know that I'm right with God, that he loves me, that he cares for me, his compassion is so amazing. That's why I can have a celebration and that's why I can put lights on my house and buy gifts for my family and my friends and my loved ones because there really is a reason to celebrate this time of year and it's got Christ's name on it. It's Christmas. It's the coming of the Lord. It's the reality of Jesus that really brings life to us. Joy, strength. As we share this service with our family in West Seattle. I wanna challenge every one of us to open our hearts to this reality of Jesus, who he is, with all the trimmings that go along with this amazing season. You gotta understand, I am not against Christmas. In fact, I think the world ought to pull out all the stops to celebrate. But the reality should be, we should be celebrating the message that makes it great, which is Jesus Christ, the Savior, is born. The advent, the coming of Jesus should impact and mark every one of our lives. And you know, the great moment is when it becomes personal. It doesn't really have much significance until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says God gave his only son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish. That doesn't mean just even die in this natural world. It means dying and never being separated from God because we're an eternal soul that we would never be shut out of the presence of God, but we would know God right here, right now. We would know his love. And you know, that love is so amazing. Today, you may be under the weight of the world. You might just feel broken. There may be just unresolved issues, not just in our culture, but a lot of unresolved issues right here in this room. People that have hurt us, disappointed us, lied about us, walked out on us, cheated us, done us wrong. I mean, there's a lot of things. And if it's not brought to God, it just festers, it's, it's, it's unresolved. And in the midst of that place of being unresolved, that's where unfulfillment comes. It's where brokenness comes. It's where substitutes and, and, and cheap substitutes come. Instead of really knowing wholeness, we try to fill the gaps with putty instead of really letting God bring wholeness and life to us. There's a love today, church. Some of us are walking outside of faith and we're just trying to make it through the best we can. And we're trying to capture just as much excitement or fun that we can squeeze out of this world. But I just wanna to say to you in this Christmas season, the celebration of Jesus, that there's something more than just trying to squeeze a little moment of joy or peace out of this world. And it doesn't really come by a drug, whether it's prescription or whether it's illegal or whether it's a drink or whether, whatever it is. 
It's not what money can buy. It's not what position can bring. It's not what applause can mean. All those things ultimately ring hollow. But there is one place that is so rich, so deep, and so fulfilling. And that's the moment when the human heart links with the one that made you. We sang it earlier today. Lord, it's your breath inside of our lungs. So we cry out with our praise. You know, that's what we're really talking about. Human beings, you know, coming to that place of humility, surrendering the things of this world and really finding the things that are most important, the love that God has for you. You know, my daughter Janelle was getting ready to take a flight to go be with some friends in Ohio this week. And she had a very early flight. In fact, needed to leave to go to the airport about 3.45 in the morning. And so she was telling us about this. And, and so being the dad that loves her so much, I volunteered to drive her at 3.45 in the morning. And I got an unexpected little blessing out of that. She said, you know, if, if you're willing to drive me, I'll just come home and, and stay the night in the house with you and mom. And, and then, you know, you can just drive me in the morning. And so it was a little extra blessing having Janelle underneath our roof. And, and so I set my alarm. We needed to leave at 345. So I set my alarm for 340. <laughs> it was one of those mornings, right? You know what I'm talking about. It's like a hat day. You know, you're just going to you're going to put your clothes, your shoes, and you know, boom, put the hat and out the door. And that's exactly what happened. And, but when even the alarm went off at 340, I was like, why was I volunteering for this service? But then I thought about this daughter who brings me such joy, such love in my life. And it was just a privilege, you know, just a small little thing to get up in the morning, put on the hat and be her dad drive her to the airport and take 30 minutes to just speak into her life, how proud her mom and I are of her and how much we love her. And you know, I didn't say this to her, but the truth is for a parent, there is no deeper, more fulfilling, joyous thing than to watch your kids live well, live strong and let their faith lead their steps. Let God be in their heart. And I just had that time to just go with her and talk to her and tell her how much we loved her and how proud we are of her and just encourage her to chase the dreams that God puts in her heart and to be the things that only God could make her and only the gifts that only God could give her. You know, last night we had our two little grandsons over, little Trenton, he's four now, and Drew, who's going to be uh, having his first birthday before long, just a few days. Little Drew's at that place where he's decided that, you know, life's got more for him. So he's getting up, setting up, you know, pushing himself up. No longer is he just, you know, going to be satisfied to crawl, but now he's getting up and walking. And now he's kind of even walking fast. What a picture for all of us. Some of us in our lives, even though we're adults, we've been satisfied just to crawl through this life. We've been satisfied to just go with the lowest level. I want to challenge you today. The power of Jesus, the power of what Christmas is about is the power of a God that loves you so much that his love is that he would live in you and through you. And he wants you to know that his grace is so great for you that there may be places where you feel guilty. You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like you're broken, never going to be able to get up and the dreams are never going to be fulfilled. I want you to know just as I love my little grandsons, just as I love my family and there's nothing that I would withhold from them. That is just a drop in the bucket in comparison to how God loves me and how God loves you. I want to tell you something. When Jesus came to this world, he did more than just set the alarm at 340 in the morning. He came in the divine coordinates of God. He came in the fullness of time and the glory of God came and was born miraculously through a woman and became the savior of the world. And we ought to be able to shout about it today and to know that because of Jesus, because of his love, I can be forgiven. I can get out of the pit that I've been in and I can get up and I can not just crawl, but I can walk and I can run and I can dream because God loves me. And that's the miracle of what Christmas is really all about. You know, the broken places of your life, that's the attack of the enemy. That's not the gift of God. The devil comes to kill, to rob, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. I want to just challenge us today. Stop living for the things of this world which are temporary, which are cheap imitations of what it is just to have peace with God. 
Family in West Seattle today, I want to just encourage you. Take that next step with God. God's doing amazing things in our family in West Seattle, but you as an individual, let the grace of God go deep in your heart. Right here in this family, right here in Issaquah, right in this room, the same link. Let us not miss the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of what this message of great joy is really all about. God loves you that much. Would you take a moment with me today? Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? This might be something new to you, but it's just a moment of spiritual reflection to just bow your heads, to just close your eyes and just think about just between you and God. There's not enough time that we take this moment of just heartfelt personal reflection. The question is, when the greatest gift of all has been freely handed to you through Jesus, have you received that gift? The Bible says in the book of John, to those who would receive him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. The greatest gift is that you could know that you're right with God. You don't clean yourself up. You don't go figure it all out. You don't go get rid of any bad habits or things that you feel are destructive. You come as you are and you just open your heart and faith and you realize this, this is a gift only because it's free. Why do we give gifts at Christmas? Because we want to express love. We want to put a smile on somebody's face. We want to bring blessing to them. That is minuscule compared to why Jesus came into this world, the Lord, that you could know that you are right with your God. You are right with your Lord. There's no more barrier. When you ask God to forgive you, you are forgiven. Even though you remember those things, God is different. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. God forgives and forgets, and he gives you a clean slate. And he doesn't want you overtaken with grief. He doesn't want you overtaken with guilt. You just need to understand, he is your heavenly father, and he loves you beyond what we could ever imagine. And so today, I'm going to invite Pastor Larry in West Seattle to come and lead this service right now, lead you in prayer lead you in a response time. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Lord, I ask God in both of our campuses right now, Holy Spirit, draw near to your people. Lord God, prompt in our heart the things that we need to see, the things that we need to be aware of. And I pray, Lord, that you would give the measure of faith right now to respond to God's love, to respond to God's grace, that not one person, young, old, or in between, would miss the miracle of Jesus. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen.